So hello, Madeline. I'm really happy to have you for this online talk uh, in the program Dance and Age uh, within the project Tempus Fugit. Uh, I would also uh, would like to welcome the philosopher Buyan Magjev uh, on whose idea actually the whole project was built upon. Uh, the, the, the main focus of the talk will be the initiative Dance On Ensemble, which was launched in 2015 in uh, Berlin. And maybe please let me play a video that you chose, Madeline, as the beginning of our talk, and then we'll continue. Great, thank you. <laughs> At the end of every show, I used to run to the dressing room, take off all my clothes, squeeze them out and then collect all the sweat that was coming out of them inside an empty bottle. I did this for more than 20 years <laughs> and I had at least 27 liters of my sweat. I kept the bottles in a closet and uh, from time to time I used to give a quick look at them and I noticed that the color of the liquid inside of the bottles started changing. At the beginning it was white transparent, yeah? And then it turned into blue. From blue it went to green, from green to yellow, and then it went into a dirty kind of transparent again. And I also saw that there was a thick layer of white sediment emerging at the bottom of the bottle and the liquid somehow was diminishing as if it was evaporating. Indeed, with uh, the years, it completely disappeared and only this white sediment was left. So what I did is that I collected all the remains of this sediment from all the bottles and I put it in a little nylon bag I waited and I had around 11 grams of my sweat powder. <laughs> so, I don't know how this crazy idea came to my head, but with one of my nostrils, I, uh, I sniffed a little bit of it. <laughs> and this strange image appeared in front of my eyes. It came like a flash, but the effects were amazing. It reminded me of performances from the past that I had forgotten. It was so beautiful that I decided to do just a little bit more. And again, it was like magic. Memories from the past performances came to me and it was all in one image. One sublime image, all those years with all those dances entangled an image that lasted for a few seconds before it disappeared. I was, I was so taken by the magic of it that I decided to take all the powder. So I put it in a cup of water, I stirred it and I drank it like a shot. And then something very strange happened to my body. In an instant, it was dancing all the dances that I had danced my whole life. After that, I fell into the floor and immediately I died. <laughs> Days later, all the newspapers announced my death and they said that the cause of my death was overdose of drugs. But in reality, it was overdose of my dance sweat. Thank you. I hope everybody saw the video all right. It was okay for you? Yes, perfect. So it was an excerpt of a performance by Dance On Ensemble uh, by the theater director Rabbi Mrue, right? And the name of the, the performance is Water Between Three Hands. 
And I would like Mar uh, Madeline to start with a very general question. What triggered actually your uh, interest uh, towards the relation between dance and age? Uh, yes, Amir, I think the, um, the answer a little bit was the video which you just saw. And I selected it for that reason. For us, the Dance on Initiative is about the worth of an individual dancer. And we don't uh, think very strongly that there is no expiry date uh, on the dancers, but we have it very traditionally, specifically when you come from ballet, uh, also in the mind of the dancer is there is this limited time span, 35, 40 years. We made a big questionnaire while traveling through Europe with the project. When do you think a dancer stops dancing, performing on stage? And most of the members of the audience would have in their heads and say 35 to 40 years. And the next question, well, do you think they should stop or would you like to see them on stage? She said, yes, of course we would like to see them. And the reasons we asked him why, and they said, well, because of the, the beauty of their performance, what they have to tell us, the life experience, the excellence of the maturity of their art and all the good reasons. So uh, that was actually the, the background. And I mean, it had been done before with the Entity 3, which is a famous example. And when we ask people, well, do you know companies with all the dancers? And they also, of course, have in their heads the Pina Bausch company. Uh, because when you are already in the company, you could age with the company in her work. But it was exceptional. And so we, we thought it's time to make, a, you could say, a cultural political statement, but with an artistic project of excellence saying, you know, we, we invite dancers to join who are over 40, so you can't join when you're under 40, and ask um, choreographers, directors uh, to work with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I would like to ask Boyan to uh, a little bit broaden up the conversation and elab elaborate on the notions of time and age uh, and why and how he came up with the idea of Tempus Fugit. And why now? Why now he thought that it would be relevant for this contemporary moment mm -hmm. to uh, delve into these matters? Well, thank you, Mira. Uh, I think it was a both fortunate and misfortunate coincidence. Because fortunate, because on the one hand, I was very much into the reflection around questions of time in a more philosophical perspective, but also in artistic perspective. And by the way, some of the lecture classes that I gave in, in Berlin, uh, not far from Dan Son's rehearsal studios in the Ufer studios, mm. were precisely dealing with the question of reversal of time. So I already was kind of into this reflection. But then what happened two years ago was precisely the pandemic of COVID-19, which also, I, I would say, um, put very much forward the questions of experience of age, of age differences, of the political and social and economic issues which came with, uh, with this situation. And I have to say, this is for uh, Madeleine especially, that in Bulgaria, I, I would say these problems were quite, uh, I should say, quite, um, quite dramatic in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not only in, in, in the sense of um, generational shift, but especially I think uh, it was uh, dramatic for, for artists who were uh, um, already in the age of retirement or around this age, because it is obvious that there were a lot of means of support of uh, young artists, of networks of support, of uh, um, uh, Ministry of Culture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, which don't, don't cover at all uh, mature artists, so yeah. to say, and and I think that this was a very clear also question of uh, of, of age difference when uh, you see those who have a sort of a uh, capacity of you know of experience of uh, accumulated techniques mm -hmm. of also of teaching experience are somehow removed yeah. uh, from the scene, and and from that point of view, I think that's some as an initiative of, of uh, Madeleine Ritter and, and um, her partners was, I think, uh, really uh, kind of targeting, anticipating such a situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because I think it's a political uh, project yeah. in a mm -hmm. way, but yeah. also genuinely artistic. 
Yeah. Because I think we shouldn't sentimentalize age. And this is one oh. of the... <laughs> I'm 61. <laughs> melancholy, etc. On the contrary, I think the one of the intuitions of dance, only if I understood it well, but I somehow followed from the beginning because of the physical proximity, I think it's the intuition that with maturity, with age, there are other competences, other techniques, mm -hmm. other forms of radicality, even because young artists very often speak of radicality. I think radicality of elderly artists sometimes is even kind of yeah. much more impressive. These intuitions, I think, were really embodied by this project. So I'm really glad that Madeline is with us here today. And I think you're totally right. And it, uh, the, the pandemic put in, and um, um, it's like a... Uh, an uh, enlarging glass, how do you mm. say? Uh, because we got a lot of interest from the media without performing, because we couldn't perform. You know, we had several premieres, like everybody, you know, we were just in, in you know, hiding in the studios, you could say, uh, trying to work on. Uh, but uh, there was a strong interest because we became a, a symbol, both the dancers in general uh, were really struck hard by the pandemic by that because the body is your own instrument. And if you couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, go to the studio with the others, you're really locked out from even the work you do and also the, all the other work. That was the one thing. And then we had the subject of age and this guy, the, uh, this uh, positive image of dancing on. It's really, we had uh, mainstream media we, who suddenly were filming us, interviewing us, doing reportage. We even had a cool motor, um, fashion shooting in one of the big magazines <laughs> with the beauty of, you don't see much of the body because it's an art, art, art photographer. But, but the idea was that um, it, it felt exactly as you said, Bojan, um, uh, because of what happened during the pandemic, it became even more evident. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, or let's say for, for me with, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, since many years, I'm really working on the cultural political aspects of funding and how to improve the situation for dance, really, really on the basics, on the working conditions, on the study, you know, the hard city where you're working, we funded that with the Tanzplan Deutschland to really start uh, supporting structures which really make dance stronger. And somehow we all had a blind spot on the subject of age. Also the independent artists mm -hmm. and most of them are choreographers and dancers. So they think, oh, I always can choreograph for myself. So I, I always can dance. But when you look closely, exactly what you said with the funding system, they drop out on, on the long career development uh, in other fields where you have the senior experts, they get the highest salary. <laughs> because of their experience and it's as you said reversed in dance and uh, and from the art side there is no reason for that there is no it's just I would say bad habits mm. <laughs> yeah one of my questions would be then do you think that there is a certain pressure ex exercised by the culture itself and particularly by the dance structures and dance environment towards dancers beyond certain age just to quit yeah. at a certain point of their career. And I would like also to, to bring the Eastern perspective, which I think Boyan could bring because he had been working on a project uh, uh, focused on Bhutto dance. Uh, and yes, he was uh, uh, researching uh, Hijikata's, uh, Tsukumi Hijikata's uh, performance and archive. So I would like to ask him also the, the, uh, what is the treatment towards the aging body in this culture? And, and uh, if I um, may say something, which is also bridge to your um, archival work, let's say, before we had the Dance On Initiative, we had a big initiative to show the value of the history, what's bred in the bone mm. and what, what is unseen because we don't have museums for dance. You can't go in and see, ah, oh, this is where it comes from. In any museum you see, you know, from the beginning of the last century to uh, uh, contemporary art and you can make connections. So it's a, like a space of knowledge which you as an audience, uh, but also the artist. And in dance, it wasn't existing, mainly only through technique, that the techniques were giving on. And with the heritage, also it showed there is a whole generation who are uh, very old and they became so valuable. Reinhold Hoffmann, you know, older, uh, who were still there to really work with the younger artists to create that link. And then you have something like other cultures who really see, and this is the Japanese culture, for example, who see the body as a container of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that uh, you become 
you could say a national treasure for your art because clearly the dance is passed on. So there in other cultures, there is a different value given to the body as the container of history and knowledge in dance than we have in our European. And I think it comes strongly from the belly with the connection to sport to be very uh, agile and uh, high performance on, on a delivery level. So I, I do think there is a strong reason for that. So when you said the systems, yes, it is education. It is also the theaters, the festivals, but also the companies whom they hire, all of them. Mm. And I do believe, I absolutely agree. I think there are cultural, economic, political patterns that are somehow functioning by inertia and they're really pressurizing the, the field of, of arts. So the assumption of, let's say, fashion uh, economies or even health economies that like the, the, the body, the, the model of the fit, healthy body is the young body. I think this yeah. is absolutely wrong assumption, even mm. in biological theory that I'm very much interested uh, in these days, this is wrong, you know? So maybe the most precarious forms of uh, biological existence are the young, <laughs> the young uh, um, bodies and not, not the adults. So that from that point of view, we have, we have a very, um, a different variety, I would say, complex balance of between social groups, between economic also kind of um, uh, equality of, in distribution, but this is a broader political issue. But in terms of, of dance, I think this was really a, an inertia inherited uh, from the past that uh, in all other fields of art, take uh, visual arts. I mean, like yeah. very <laughs> often, like, Louise Bourgeois, famous in seven, she was exactly, exactly. <laughs> Leonora Carrington, and like there are so many examples, or or uh, like of the um, Maria Lasnik in Austria, in Austria, like the the radical exactly. elderly artist. Mm. So that's a, such a mm. such a figure, and I think we also had some examples of this kind of iconic figures in the field of dance, like Alicia Alonso or Anna Palov or Katsuo Ono. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were kind of exceptions. They were already mm -hmm. taken as a sort of monstrosity in the sense that they're out of the, uh, the norm. So they're a form of pathology. And, and as we know, after uh, Georges Canguilhem, pathology and norm are constructed concepts. I mean, mm -hmm. we can take as a normative body and normative movement patterns, the patterns of uh, 90 years old uh, Katsuono. Yeah. or of a differently abled person. Yeah. And that's why I, I started creating my own narrative, uh, hist historical narrative influenced by my philosophical concept of what I call counter techniques or allo techniques. So, which means different types of techniques, which are precisely not pathological techniques, not techniques that are going um, uh, astray from the norm, but they're different proposals of technical artistic uh, organization. And what is technique? I mean, broadly mm -hmm. understood, technique is a sort of a extension of a form of existence, yeah. which kind mm -hmm. of improves this form. And I think in terms of dance techniques, we can find of astonishing examples of alternative proposals of techniques coming from elderly dancers, yeah. which mm -hmm. became a paradigm of, of being followed. And this is, by the way, the example of Bruto. When Bhutto was uh, invented by uh, Hijikata Tatsumi, there were no elderly dancer. I mean, um, uh, Hijikata started with uh, Katsuo Ono's son, Yoshihito Ono, mm -hmm. and Katsuo Ono was only an ally, but he was not even dancing. And the interesting thing is that they were all young, but they were dancing as if they were this kind of a very- yeah, yeah, this. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> <laughs> because this was what was the most interesting. And in fact, I mean, I was, I've was i been discussing this with my American students online last semester. And, and there was, I, I showed them the famous little girl of Kijikatas, yeah. which is clearly influenced by Mary Wigman's mm. uh, witch dance. And it's obvious that, that he's an incredible dancer and that this is, he needs ex ex excellent uh, like uh, technical skills to perform this, but it looks like this kind of a childish, infantile dance, which is not at all. But uh, so that's, I think the, we have to change change our lenses yeah. 
you know, mm-hmm. which are cultural, social lenses. And as, I, as um, uh, Madeline said, the magnifying glass also yeah. to yeah. make different focus yeah. on certain phenomena. You're mm-hmm. totally right. And I have two anecdotes from uh, my self-experience which very much illustrate what you have been saying. One is with Kazuo Ono himself. I once went to a performance, one of the, I think probably the last one he did in Berlin. And I went there because it was announced specifically with the age that you could s- see the smell of death because he was so old. And I went there, I went to the first row and I really wanted, I said, I had, I want to see what death is. <laughs> of course, I just saw a man dancing beautifully. <laughs> so, he, But it was this exception that, you know, what all comes with age. And he was, you could say, a beautiful, you know, old dancer. Uh, so, uh, and the other one was um, uh, in, in a big performance in, in, in Nizza, Uh, uh, Merce Cunningham in uh, the uh, Merce Cunningham company, he was sitting on the chair on the stage aside from the company. And at one moment, he took his astrotic, astrotic, what do you say, um, astrose, uh, atrose, atrotic mm, uh, body, which is really distorted. And he marked, he went on stage and just danced a little with, a little part with, and marked because, of course, it's all bread in the bone. And there was a big discussion afterwards if he should have done this because people felt intimidated, embarrassed to see such a fragile uh, body among, and, and I was really angry because I thought it's his scography. He has any rights to do whatever. But what that was actually the first time when uh, uh, it, uh, there was this confrontation of what we have in our heads, which is so strong. The images, I mean, we know it from science, It's the nocebo and placebo effect. You know, we can mm-hmm. hurt ourselves with the image. You could say we hurt the dance culture with the images we have in our heads, which are very mm-hmm. strong. Mm-hmm. May I, maybe I can add a personal also anecdote because I, I, I think these are very special about the smell of death. I never heard this, but it, I think this was very much a discourse which was going around Katsuo Ono. And I think this was completely displaced because it's much, very much about the affirmation of life. Yes, exactly. <laughs> But uh, I had such an experience with, uh, this was uh, one of Boris Sharma's projects more than 10 years ago. Uh, and I was invited there in my quality of philosopher. And But I decided this time I won't teach philosophy to dancers. So I will make a dance workshop. But all, the only dance I could teach was Pogo danced, meaning my uh, punk youth in the 80s, right? And, but I had as an assistant one of the iconic dancers of uh, Merce Cunningham, Wagner Seiterfeld, mm. who was also part of this workshop. And I can tell you, this was the opening of Spring Festival in Utrecht. All famous curators, MoMA people, everybody sweated there in my workshop. They were completely destroyed, but Wagner at the end was absolutely fit completely like, really like a prima ballerina at the end of the session. I was absolutely exhausted. I took it <laughs> secretly, but, but Valde was untouched and she was 84. Yeah, so she just performed way on. Huh? She performed way on. Yeah. I saw her yeah. also yes. and it is, it's spectacular. It's spectacular. Yes. Um, so yes, there is no, I mean, we could add many, many examples of uh, uh, very old and, and, and maybe one, Uh, last one, there is uh, with the work of Rabbi Moe in another work, which is called uh, You Should Have Seen Me Dancing Waltz. Um, there is a very highly um, emotional text about a sniper who looks at a woman and then shoots her. So that's the text. And you hear the text. And there is a 70-year-old dancer of the company, Christine Kronos, standing. And she does very simple m- movement. Very, you know, it's not an expressive dance piece about death. But the way she contains the text in her body It's exceptional. It's so touching. It's uh, it's mind blowing, and because of what she carries and what she can also in a very direct way with the audience. So actually, I, I do think we lose a lot in relation what dance because we always say, well, contemporary dance is not so easy on the audience. I think the mature dancer can bring another level uh, of direct link to the audience. Oh, yeah. Uh, from that point of view, sorry, Mira, I just wanted to, uh, that, that the, this introductory scene that you chose, Madeline, I think was extremely important because it challenges the perspective of a body as a performing body only, because this, I think, is excellent idea for Rabis uh, about the sweating body, which 
produced by its own excess, by its own labor effort, it produced another body, which is kind of a quintessential body, but it is also an archive of the body. Yes. And precisely the mature artist has this kind of, her or his body is becoming an uh, uh, embodied archive and of techniques, but of experience, which I think it was an excellent uh, metaphor of Rabin Roy, who is, of course, a, a good friend of ours. Uh, I will try to just uh, play an excerpt of uh, the performance that Madeline just spoke about. You should have seen me. She dance. is in her 60s oh, yeah. and has a heavy body, full and limp. The woman jumps from one point to the other, not caring about her body's heaviness and its wrinkles. dancing waltz in a very strange and exciting way. <laughs> well, you're amazing, Mira. You just <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank yes, you. It was uh, Christine Kono, the yeah, uh, uh, there and she also she has that because she she has she worked with so many also as a teacher because also you know when you you know it right if you don't know it teach it so once mm. you really can I mean boy and you know it you know you really come to know what you teach so that also actually enriches it's not you stop so ideally if someone teaches he's still also dancing because normally it says well you know at a certain age then you become a teacher because you're no longer mm. able to perform so uh, the both if it, it it, it goes together, it enriches both the teaching and, of course, the performing as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And since modernity, the beauty in dance is no longer associated with perfection or virtuosity or technique. So it's about presence, individuality, archive, past, knowledge, so many things that constitute the notion of beauty, I would say. Yes. So yes. I think dance on is about that as well. And I'm curious also to discuss uh, the uh, points of social political agency of contemporary dance. And is it a good platform to, to uh, uh, articulate critical reflection towards these uh, obsessions of contemporaneity that we just discussed? Do you want the to uh, idealization of uh, uh, youth and uh, this operational functional manner of producing all the time success, speed, exhilaration, and age being seen as a deficit as something that is weak, that does not produce, is, could not be captured in the capitalistic uh, regime of uh, yeah, performativity that produces some good, let's say. I mean, you, 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 you triggered all the points, Mira, in one... <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. It's all so there, it would, yeah. would be a whole whole semester to talk yeah. about. Probably. Rian has a book on this as well. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, this, uh, I think uh, this is why it is so important. For example, we have um, a new work, we call it Making Dances, Dancing Replies. And we took iconic works from Lucinda Childs from the, her very early work when she started doing silent works, Merce Cunningham, a very early one, experimental one with three. And uh, we also have a Martha Graham because one of the dancers mm. is a long time soloist. And um, we then asked contemporary artists, some younger, some mature, Tim Atchels, Mathilde Monnier and Enrico Ginevra, uh, Enrico Ticcioni and Ginevra Pansetti um, to uh, do an, uh, create answers and what, uh, is uh, very interesting both for the artists so you have these very radical works and they stay radical that's the amazing part there is something because one always says such an ephemeral art form but it stays the work has a substance which really transcends time that's f my first conviction but also people to speak people need to dance it 
that's the, the ultimate experience that you dance it yourself as a dancer, but of course for an audience also to see this work. And then when it's related to contemporary work, it also um, um, opens different viewpoints on the contemporary world because we never are out of time. We never, we can't be. We are, though we exist only in the moment, but we, it's all bread and the bone. I mean, you know, with all the mother's generations. And I think in the country where you come from, there is also another part in society which has this strong link. And somehow in dance, um, uh, it's, it's not so evident, but when it's opened, it's like a treasure box. Mm. And I will try to show a part of an excerpt of uh, Lucinda Child's yeah. performance. And maybe I say something before? Sure. Um, so, hmm, so, share. <laughs> um, uh, so what is interesting to know, and then we, uh, the, the, uh, since 2019, one of the first dancers of the dance ensemble, which as, as you said, was funded in 2050. Tai Bumashain then became the artistic director and he's a long time dancer and also stager of Lucinda's work. And also uh, mm -hmm. very, and uh, it started from a conversation where she actually disregarded her early works. Mm -hmm. They were laying around, there were one or two which had been done in a certain time and then because she wants to do new work, that's normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As an artist, you don't really want to dig in, <laughs> you know, in the closets what's hanging around there. You, you like to just work and be creative. But then she, she was open to it and, uh, and it became a beautiful uh, conversation about which work uh, to, to uh, pick. And, uh, and when she first uh, uh, performed this work in Paris, when she was asked, uh, because there was a strong interest, uh, when was that? Uh, yeah, it was in the, in the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the audience booed. Uh, and they said, where's the music? There must be, uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, they, they, they call the technicians, turn on the music, <laughs> do your work. <laughs> and they were, the music is actually the sound of the body. And so we see an excerpt of these early works, uh, which uh, I talked before, as the mm. works. Give me a minute. It had always been a dream of mine to stage these early works from Lucinda Child. There's nothing to hide behind. There's no extraneous movements, costumes or lighting or even characterizations or virtuosity to kind of disappear behind. It's really stripped down and it really shows the people. It's perfect for a group of dancers who have so much to share just by being there. They have such histories and they have such stories written on their bodies that just the simplicity of them being in the room is enough. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> And actually, I wanted to ask you uh, how, because you're working with a variety of uh, directors and choreographers, how do you select them? And who decides that? Do you do work on topics? Do you, uh, uh, are you interested in real, different formats? Or how does it work? All of it, Mira. All of it. <laughs> you always ask the perfect question. <laughs> it's all the, <laughs> Sorry, no, yes that, or no. I mean, there is... Um, in the very beginning, for the first edition, we really looked together. Uh, Christopher Roman was the first uh, director. Together with him, you know, who would be interesting for mature dancers? Uh, and uh, we started asking people like Rabbi Moe and uh, uh, who had never made a dance piece, but uh, I saw him mm -hmm. performing in an, with actually with Boris Shamatz in a situation and asked him just like that, would you like to make a dance piece with all the dancers? And he just said, of course, I always wanted to make a dance. So sometimes it was very simple. It came from uh, situations when there was uh, either from me or then from Christopher, he really had a relation with Deborah Hay. And of course, with Foresight, we had for a time a Foresight piece in there. So it came from the own lineage. Also this, as I said, with um, uh, Lucinda, 
before, uh, really from the, the you know, the uh, Tai Bumashan, who is now the artistic director of working with her. But then also we, uh, he always says, well, we want to have, as a mature dancer, you don't want to be bored. You really want mm. to be, uh, um, work with something which catches your curiosity. And it can be something so difficult as this physical verb slash Lucinda. First, when you look at it, it looks simple, but it's mm. uh, all the dancers said it's the hardest thing they ever danced in their life. And they really uh, uh, conquered the world. Mm. It is that. Or with Rabbi Moe, who really works um, on, the, on the subject of um, uh, uh, the, the politics of the body, but also very much death and uh, what is left. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, speaks also to mature dancers with uh, when you have the body, which is fragile and, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, all the techniques you develop um, to keep it. <laughs> mm. say. And he, he they, they love working with him because he is a partner, both, you could say, for the heart and for the art. Mm. So, uh, the, the last for a future piece, we asked uh, Christoph Papadopoulos, Mm -hmm. for a big group piece where all the 12 dancers we work with. And there it was, Tai said, we really want to work on the musicality of dance and really on the, the, the scripture of dance. Is that the right word? Not technique, but something who really uses the composition of dance, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. something else, which is in the, in the heart of the art form. So, and he has that quality. So it comes from conversation of what, what is, you know, what have we done already? And also, um, uh, what really is in uh, the core of the art form which we want to develop and what's interesting for the dancers. Uh, um, mm -hmm. um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also, uh, uh, while looking through the repertoire, I also came upon this performance, which actually I wanted to invite some time ago, Ivana Müller's performance with Dance on Ensemble. Mm -hmm. It also has another perspective of dealing with these notions of time and age, the, the threats, this performance. Yeah, uh, it's very much, it was uh, before we always said, this is a carte blanche, just because the dancers are older, the, the, whatever you do, it does not need to be the subject of age and everything around it, or the stories of the dancers, what they did in their lives, you know do whatever you are interested in the moment in your art form and uh, do it together with the dancers. Mm. And, uh, and this is our proposition. But then we said, well, maybe it's time to really do a, a piece which is about aging, time, mm. what's left and how you deal with that, both uh, as a, a human being, but then also what it means for uh, um, uh, having it uh, on the performance space. And so when we talked to Ivana, it was about that. So mm -hmm. the, the, the original title, the working title was Aging. Now it became Threats because mm -hmm. they have the threats as a symbol of unfolding and uh, uh, wrapping up and, uh, uh, you know, letting it go. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, she became the, the, the first because she works so much from the concept of um, uh, also language and mm -hmm. also because it was a piece together with the actors from the Münchner Kammerspiele. So it was clear we wanted to work both with actors and with dancers. So this is how the, uh, we uh, came into a conversation with uh, Ivana Müller. You know that? What? In this moment, I have an image in my mind. Seden is a piece that could be actually seen as a series of meditations on different concepts of time. For the first time in my life, I... Truly understood that it's a collaboration between performers that are dancers of Dance On Ensemble in Berlin and actors from Kammerspiele in Munich. Category, daily item. We are actually thinking about different concepts of time from the point of view of now. And this now can be seen as a suspended moment in time, in our personal times, in the kind of historical time also. We can reflect about what was past and maybe trying to imagine what is the future. At first, the main idea of this work was to reflect about the process of aging as a process of time passing, something that is inherent in everybody's, let's say, living contract. And it was interesting also to look at it from uh, different points of view of people participating in the project, as they have different age, they have different experiences, 
uh, both as humans and as performers. The specific quality of this piece also comes from a relation with a material that we are using, yarns like this, that are accompanying the process of thinking, but they're also defining, let's say, uh, the gestures, the movements, the necessities to move. And actually, through raveling and unraveling the yarns, we are also raveling and unraveling stories about time, about our specific or collective relationship to time. I'm done. Okay. Already? How long yeah. was it? 93 seconds. Wow. wow. It felt like a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> as in most of my works, we have used the text almost as a choreographic material. That means that we were treating it in a more poetic way, thinking more of it as being a music that has a certain intensity, color, etc. The textuality of the piece is not aiming to tell a story. The text is very closely embodied with physical actions or physical conditions. So it's actually the text, the movements, and also the presence of the material that are then in a dialogue and creating a language of the piece. Now? Yes. Why not? But going back to that moment. Which moment? Well, the moment you realize that you always be older and never younger. That moment is probably quite liberating. Sorry, what were we talking about? I don't know. I forgot. I forget all the time. So I'd like to ask you about the mission that you mentioned, that you have a mission also to inspire us for a similar project in other communities, uh, other places. Uh, what kind of ensembles or such projects have you done already or have you initiated in through traveling to places and working with people? Hmm. Uh, my, my partner always says your, your, your path is plastered with failed um, missions and visions, but you always have a good plan. <laughs> so the plan we had to actually enlarge because in the beginning it was just six dancers and how can six dancers change something, you could say. Mm. And they can perform, there are so many performances. We are a small organization and we really thought, and then this when we created a, a European network, which is called, and we actually got funding from the Creative Europe, it's called Dance On, which mm. is what we talk about, Pass On, what we also talked about, you know, really what, what's passed on as knowledge um, in this ephemeral, ephemeral uh, art form. And then Dream On, that also for everybody, there is no reason to stop dancing. Actually, you know, I, one, uh, one of the dancers said, I imagine I dance till my last breath. Uh, mm -hmm. but also for ordinary people. Uh, and so this is really an, an, a growing network and uh, we do collaborations um, uh, with artists and uh, with something we call Dance on Extended is actually where we give our dancers to mm -hmm. our projects. We say, well, you know, we, have, we are working with these beautiful dancers. If you want to make a piece with them, we find money to pay the, our dancers. So it's a practical production support Mm -hmm. um, and also it, uh, it and it can be a mix like with Jan Martens we did the youngest it doesn't need to be an old cast the youngest dancer in um, uh, any attempt will end in crushed bodies and broken bones right that's the title mm -hmm. the youngest one is 16 and the oldest 68 and it's three of our dancers and we are collaborating and so it's both uh, you could say sustainability what we think of as making use of our production means making use in a good way of the beauty and quality of the dancers but also connecting us with others not mm -hmm. just our own uh, production so we we try out ways to really extend and so we are open for <laughs> mm. uh, anybody who wants to get in contact with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, one last question. Boyan, will you tell us more about this Hijikata project, please? Because it's a huge one and it's in process, ongoing. So will you enlighten us a little bit? Yes, um, thank you. I mean, I, I'll try to connect uh, um, uh, the Hijikat uh, project to what um, Madeline just described, because I think I really very much believe in this word substance. And, you know, in philosophy, it's kind of outdated and it says, oh, this is substantialist, metaphysical, etc., etc. But I think we need to rethink what substance is, because if we live in this kind of contemporary idea of 
you know, of the uh, ultimate contemporaneity, there is nothing left, mm. you know, everything is left over, mm. you know, there is no archive, there is no memory. And I think we need to rethink the substance precisely through perhaps the concept of threat, because concept, uh, substance is something that is being, you know, weaved mm. ongoingly or reweaved. So it's something that is in a constant transformation, but it still has presence, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how there is some synthesis of temporality possible. And I think that Dan Son is, because I, I followed uh, their, their work, uh, especially uh, very closely in the beginning. And, uh, and, and I can say that there was this double attempt on, on one hand to not simply reenact, but really to re, how should, re, um, 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 I would say to revitalize, mm -hmm. revitalize something that is put somehow, uh, you know, um, under the carpets of history, mm -hmm. but it has substance. So it needs certain uh, mechanism, certain frame to just reemerge because it is there under, you know, it's a, a little bit botanical meta metaphor, but it is there in the soil and it can reemerge. So it is a reemergence of something that was there a long mm. time ago, but of course it doesn't reemerge in the same way. So I think this is quite beautiful and also politically, but also artistically important. So, and I think this is what is uh, genuine substance in this project that it's not only about political surplus value, but it is about genuine artistic value and that the artistic value is a political value. I, I think mm -hmm. that's something that is very important. And then you also produce new work. You know, I think this is very important as well, that there is a new project emerging out of this situation. I think this is a, the, really a political task. And as to our um, work on Chikijikata, this is part of my uh, of course, uh, uh, work with the Meteor Collective. So it was uh, initiated by Meteor, meaning Annie Vassivel, Leonid Yovchev, and myself, but also my Japanese friends, the philosophers Yasu Kobayashi and uh, Futoshi Hoshino. By the way, Kobayashi was witnessing the, the late Hijikata's work, and he was he has quite a, a connection to this to this mm -hmm. scene. And our interest, of course, was first of all triggered by um, artistic interest, uh, but also it was triggered by, I would say, historical and philosophical interest, because historical interest is great. Because, for instance, Hijikata and also Katsuo Ono are a very, I would say, uh, powerful example on how uh, artistic or art historic narratives are created, or how stereotype, stereotypes are established. And when we started studying, especially with the uh, mediation of our Japanese partners, when we visited the Hijikata archive, when we worked with Japanese artists, we realized that somehow the, the very narrative of history is already transformation okay. of history. And somehow how the genuine substance sometimes is, is displaced because of the needs of the market, because of the needs of the certain situations. And of course, it is always like that in history. So we don't, we don't try to disclose the original substance of Hijikata's work, but we see a, a potential that is somehow uh, not unpacked, that there is a potential which is absolutely, how should I say, uh, young in the sense that he's very fresh. And it is, for instance, what we discovered that uh, Hijikata Tsumi already in the late 90s, uh, 50s, sorry, late 90s, 59, for instance, mm -hmm. is writing on the political substance of performance art, mm -hmm. of, which is a discourse that in Europe and in an American studies arrived much later. So uh, there is so interesting development in, in, in that. And in fact, of course, our attempt is to recreate this work by other means. So this, this interesting artistic what, what our um, uh, common friend Helmut Pstöbst was calling transmed transmedial uh, connection. This was something, it was a, a big interest in, in the field of dance. So for instance, we try to identify the literary sources of Bhutto, which are very much connected to French literature. Mm. Artaud, um, uh, Bataille, L'Autre mm. Marquis de Sade. So it's, uh, of course, uh, Jean Genet. The mm. first nickname of Hijikata was 
Hijikata Jeunet. Mm-hmm. It's a very interesting thing. So basically, this was initially a technique of, so, so to say, translating literary techniques, narrative techniques, rhetorics, poetry into body, bodily techniques. So that's a quite interesting. And then afterwards, Hijikata started working with visual language. So basically, he was making sort of cut-ups out of really of magazines, of catalogs. For instance, uh, you know, reproductions of, uh, of, of um, Chile, of Chile or Renoir. Mm-hmm. Who would imagine that be, uh, behind Bruto you would have a visual script of Chile and Renoir? Mm-hmm. And then it, it opens a completely different perspective on Bruto, but also on the idea of cultural transmission and in, in, um, kind of a, um, uh, interference and also mediation, transfer. And then, in philosophical terms, it is extremely interesting how um, this kind of a precarity of media, precarity of, of narratives, create a very powerful potential of producing new work. And basically, the outcomes now of our Hijikata projects are, um, you know, a choir based on written poetic texts that I co-authored with Hijikata Tatsumi because we started translating his own texts that are unknown. Mm-hmm. Uh, to my knowledge, there was only one TDR uh, magazine which translated two texts, which are our Japanese colleagues show that they, they are not perfectly translated by a Japanese scholar. Then Shamatz, uh, together with um, Jean Balibar, they also, I, I think they're the only contemporary dance who worked with Hijikata's text from his famous diaries. Mm. Um, and, and they are known in Europe. So this is our critical work on his text, but which we try to recreate in a poetic, theatrical work at that moment through Leonid Yovchev, mm. this the prominent Bulgarian actor whom we work with, a uh, solo, and uh, Ani Vasova is the, the director, like the leading figure of mm. Meteor, and myself, I work on this kind of a poem, I call it dark poem to answer Ankoko Butu, the dark dance mm. proposal, which is very much trying to trigger the political implications of Bhutto that are completely unknown. This idea of transformation of the body that is connected to certain political uh, utopia in Hijikata's text, very strange, very problematic in a way as well. And the interesting outcome is, this is my fantastic proposal, is that the Mishima Yukio's failed coup d'etat, you know, this conservative mm. coup that he tried to to trigger and as a result he commits uh, seppuku was perhaps influenced by his fellow Hijikata's famous uh, project uh, Hijikata Tatsumi and the Japanese people which was in a way an attempt to in the year of 68 to talk to Japanese people and to trigger some sort of a social transformation by by uh, artistic means and from that point of view this is of course the reflection on this perhaps lost utopia on the radical power of art, mm. uh, the political utopia of 50 years ago. But at the same time, we try to stimulate, to mobilize the possibility of a new, I would say, critical utopia. Mm. We don't believe in this kind of radical revolution that would mm. transform the world, but I think that we need this kind of a critical utopias that allow us to rethink our legacy, our physical archives, our cultural archives, and to produce perhaps a better synthesis mm. times in future. So I that mean, future is possible. And I mean, it's, it's yeah, sorry, yeah. very important in Bhutto as well. I mean, so what, listening, listening to you um, uh, being so passionate uh, about it, I think this is, demonstrates very much how alive, you know, the, 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 the whole subject of uh, heritage and history in dances and also how interconnected it is with everything in society because we always think, ah, oh, dance is, you know, there and the rest is there. Always dance has always the problem is uh, being uh, um, experienced as outside of society there, you know, for mm. the joy in a general way, but also uh, also not so serious as an art form. But what you say is it's a, it's a, it's a, it has all the levels on the philosophical le- uh, level and also political level. Uh, and also what you describe, what you want to do is because I'm in the board of the Pina Bausch Foundation and the task is how, 
how to access and what does it mean to have a living archive, but with the resources of the physical archive, let's say the text. And, and with Pina, of course, it's all the videos because they're all there. And actually there is a strong connection also with uh, your archive. It was always talked that somehow we, we um, need to work uh, 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 with your archive um, and uh, because it's uh, it has such an exceptional value. When you look around dance from individual artists, there is not so much uh, uh, really as a, as a substance of archive. And then mm -hmm. the, the, the question really uh, is, and this is what we tried with the heritage and what you just described is really how to touch it, what to do with it, you know, uh, and also not be afraid. The substance can't be heard. It's like um, the culture political level is, both neither the body nor the, the heritage in, in, in dance, it's not a disposable art form. And it's so much like creating something new permanently and the rest doesn't count. That means it's disposable. It doesn't mean anything. You have no, uh, no ground. The feet are not on the ground. They're uh, somewhere lost in space, you could say. And, and initiatives like what you describe, what you are doing, or what the Pina Bausch Foundation is doing, or also when you really restage what uh, Shamatz has been doing. You know, uh, he, he is so obsessed with it in a beautiful way. <laughs> Mm. It's amazing. His love. I mean, I was on the on the big old um, field, uh, the big um, um, uh, uh, airport, Tempelhof, and everybody was dancing wigmen and stuff. And he was demonstrating how to do it in Berlin, and everybody had fun. It was really hot, and we are so uh, and that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful, and and. There, um, we don't really have, I mean, in all the other art form, there is a, you could say, a science of the archive. And for dance, we really need to develop it and find our own ways. And whatever mm -hmm. you are doing uh, on both of the level of teaching and working with the archive of doing artistic project with that, it's exactly, uh, I'm, I get, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. It's the work which need, and also, you know it, uh, Mira, we, uh, when I went to Chile some, some years ago, when we talked to artists there, they said, we really, what is with our own archive? I mean, we have a history from the last 20, 30 years, and it's not there, basically, and we will not be seen in the future. You know, we are, we are you know, uh, where, and, and there's a strong desire on, on artists who are in their 40s, also from the partners we have uh, from Slovenia and uh, Serbia, uh, but also in, in the other countries. There's a strong desire um, of, of this archive to be um, interconnected and um, because it's felt that it's really enriching the, the contemporary work, but also it's really necessary uh, as an, a communication with the uh, uh, general, beyond the audience, you know, with the society. Yes, absolutely. Um me myself, I'm also uh, involved in such a project with partners from the Balkans and Western Balkans. Yes, to to do this archiving work here, which is no longer. Yeah, but why do you think it it became so important, so pressing issues? All these archiving and uh, all these revisiting of the history of iconic figures and performances. I think it's a it's a very strong trend for the last let's say ten years. In, in do you think there is some other explanation? Uh, I mean, like... I have a have a have a general theory about how the universe and everything works, <laughs> and it's part of that. Basically, at a certain time, uh, there are um, necess necessities and energies, and it's all over the place. It's not just in Europe or so. That was what I felt, for example, with the Tanz plan when we were starting with joining forces, we discovered and we didn't know it at the same time in Australia, New Zealand, Belgium, Switzerland, people were thinking in the same way. And you know it from the signs. There is a certain time when you could say an invention is due. Uh, mm -hmm. Also political disruption, also the same. You know, it's uh, and, and it's the same on that's what I mean as a, my theory about the universe and the rest, like Douglas Adams. 42 is the answer. What was it? What is the <laughs> question? I uh, know is um, uh, that that is one, it doesn't explain the specific subject. And I think on the specific chapter, it was really, uh, it was, um, I think it's connected. What is my worth? Mm. strong you know also with the with the everything is there also with the internet everything seems to accessible it seems that all mm. the knowledge is there but you don't feel it 
you can't really touch it. It's it's there and it's not there. And um, uh, so that is something uh, I think it is not just in dance. Uh, it, mm. uh, I think the dance is an expression of a desire in the society to, to base, you could say, to find some ground under your feet. Mm. Um, mm. And it's very much needed. We don't have it much. I mean, if you look in your own family, uh, once the grandparents are dead, and then you suddenly discover questions you wanted to ask them, and there is nobody to ask. And uh, um, uh, I remember <laughs> the... the the, the brother of my father really worked on the history of our family and no, the kids, we all were not interested. And then there was the moment when my father was also getting very old and he felt like we have no interest in the history. He has to safeguard the archives. So, so, uh, the, the archive. so he uh, decided to give it to an official archive and not leave it in the shelves of our family house. <laughs> to, mm. for the, but when they came and he was already ill, he, he couldn't let it go. He was holding the, the, the books in his head and not trying to let it go because there's something physical about it mm. and um, at least I see my little brother he's he's a keeper of our family archive and maybe at one point the you know the daughter's nieces will be but it's fragile it's a fragile mm. system and I think it, it we, it's interconnected with the general desire of um, because of the globalization and everything mm. it, it, it's uh, there is this uh, also from you know, this is a long sentence, but let's say when we had the, the financial crisis in, in Greece and everybody was talking about from the German side about the Greek people that they, they are living on our money and, and, and the whole culture, everything was degraded. They were just looked at in this one way of, you know, they are eating up our money right? because they had this big financial program. And at that point, I took part in a workshop there on, on the body and, and money and it was so, it was in the physics of everybody as a suffering to be degraded like that. Or we have it in, in the history of the GDR. Suddenly you are degraded. And what worth, uh, uh, what worth is an individual life, but with an individual life, it's always in the lineage. And you can make many lineages in your family, in, in your art form, on the political level. You know, when you interconnect, I'm pointing, you don't know where I'm pointing to, to Boyan right now, on the, on the um, philosophies, you know, of the decades, and um, which are uh, vital. So I think, um, and also personally, when I was young, I had no interest. It comes with age mm. on a personal level development. I think there is more, uh, once you're more middle age, you suddenly see the whole image of also that your life is final uh, eventually. So you mm. start looking at what, what, what it is made of. Would you agree on that, Boyan? It's right, it was a long one. I... <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. But I, I was very touched by your example with the family archive, because I think this is where this question starts from because I to be very honest I I have ongoingly these discussions with my sister or mother because I kind of we have the archives of two families from at least 19th century old mm. library so what how to deal physically even though mm. with uh, my father's who was a linguist legacy a lot of manuscripts and then you start asking questions we are living in a site which produces enormous amount of archives but mm -hmm. Very often these archives are effective archives, as uh, my former partner, Julia Pallardini, would put it, effective archive, right? What does it mean? Uh, effective archive. Yeah. She, she wrote this book, right? Yeah. And, um, and uh, I think that's a very big question because in, in dance, you have this issue also, of, not only in dance, the life arts. I mean, to put it in a more kind of anecdotic level, I think... To some extent, uh, young people are irresponsible to their own archives because they think life is eternal. <laughs> exactly. <right? laughs> and young artists, radical artists from the 60s zone or maybe from the 20s zone of the last century produces enormous amount of work that was not archived. Mm -hmm. Archived, and then there is a need of some sort of a maturity to be responsible towards this legacy. And that's how I think these questions came to stake at stake. Uh, unfortunately, I think academia was quite late. So in general, I mean, and I think projects like Dance Plan or Dance On was, were really important in influencing trends in both academia and also kind of in the public sphere, because I think now that's a trend 
perhaps not sufficiently institutionally framed. For instance, in Bulgaria, I think is a mm -hmm. disaster situation where archives, even of the most prominent mm -hmm. figures of like actors or who pass away, they are kind of a living history. What happens to the archives? I don't know. Are they donated to state archive or to theaters are responsible for them? I, I know stories about philosophers, even not only Bulgarian also. Uh, so these are, but this is a, a huge, I think also political mm. and cultural question. But this activity I think is absolutely worth because without archive, without memory, without past, we are doomed, right? Because this is our, our affects which are kind of sedimented in bodies. I mean, they're not kind of this kind of do dead documents. They're alive, you know? Mm. So yeah. they and can be used. And we made an experience uh, with the Pina Bausch archive. There's uh, one uh, Ricardo Viviani who was working on the uh, oral history with the dancers. And uh, to uh, go beyond the anecdote when they're telling, because uh, you know that you have the, the first layer is the stories you told many times, like in a family. You know, you have the ten most told stories yeah, when you have gatherings. It's like that. it's the same in a dance company, like Pina Bauer. But then you go deeper. Then he would really work with the physical archive, like with what was written, the images, the video, and then you open another another layer of memory of going deeper. So you need uh, um, it's it's the interest part it's the you know what the what what's what you remember as a as a physical being in uh, in your body because sometimes it's also it's really in the movement uh, you know you could trigger it. we've seen there's a beautiful uh, video of a woman with parkinson and then she starts moving and it's all there mm -hmm. It's, it's fantastic. But then, of course, what you remember, um, and maybe falsely remember, I mean, you have a whole lecture probably about <laughs> false memories, <laughs> but all, all unfolds, and it, it needs that. And then um, and Solomon Bausch, the son, always says, it needs to be danced. I mean, this is what the, the, the Cunningham uh, Foundation does. They have these capsules, and they are really teaching this, the younger generation of stages because eventually everybody who worked with him will be dead. So the, the most closest knowledge is no longer there. So you need to transmit it in that way as, as, a, as a physical and, of course, um, and, and the, the concrete, you know, what we have now, the digital archive, right? And we have, I mean, on the political level, the French are always better with that, I have to say. They... they invested 40 millions of euros so many years ago where they digitalized everything which is on radio, public radio and television. And there's a lot of dance in there. In Germany, it's not done because there's all the regionals and they destroy, they destroy the tapes. They need space. It was a lot. I mean, with Cage, we have an amazing Cage archive with the, uh, uh, from um, Cologne, uh, the, the radio station there. It wasn't really seen as a, as a treasure uh, mm -hmm. and a resource also for, 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 for use and mm -hmm. how to make use of it. And, um, and that really needs, uh, because we keep the buildings there's always money in each society. There is a lot of money of, for keeping the buildings, which is seen as our national treasure. But all the ones which is not so easy, like what is talked, danced, uh, performed, uh, um, that is the same value that needs uh, culture political uh, um, work. And mm. we are not there yet. It's really, and this is when we when we applied for the Europa Nostra with the Dance Funds Heritage Program. We were the very first applying for dance, and they discussed if we could apply at all. <laughs> and we were like the exotic ones. And then they said, "Well, well, it's sort of it's heritage, it's dance, and why not?" And then they let us, and we won a prize. And uh, this opened up mm. a little bit that actually mm. dance is part of the the European heritage as well. Mm. But if you look at the Europeana, you know, which is an, an effort by the European Union to create this European digital for dance, you don't need to go there. There isn't much mm. there. But it needs the translators, as you say. Yeah, it needs always the. Uh, it needs to be used, transmitted, spoke about. Just like that, the object is is not what. The, let's say the source is the the, no, the original or what you call the how would you call it uh, the matrix what is the substance actually <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah the well th thank you thank you very much it's been a very interesting hour for me and we've been following very long and intricate threads for an hour and a 15 minutes so thank you it was a pleasure for me to have you as my guest Thank you very pleasure. much.
for me thank as well. you yeah thank you very much Mathilde. and, and boya next time when you are in berlin please yeah. <laughs> mira yeah. as well <laughs> thank you stop me from but I, i must come back because i, I think i left uh, a cheese in my fridge because i thought it too <laughs> so i'll be back <laughs> I left in March. Could you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but, but, but we're almost neighbors because I, I know from uh, your office from Ingo is on Kreditstrasse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm I'm on Monumentalstrasse. Ah, okay, there so you go. Right. So let's let's let's. Oh, yes, that. absolutely. Def definitely, <laughs> and thank you very much. And I also think that the, the title "Tempus Fugit" is very nice. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think it, if you have a, if you stick with it, it needs a long breath uh, to really, you know, as a as a as a means of um, uh, connecting with mm. people and unfolding. Uh, um, yeah. uh, uh, th that isn't done in um, with one, let's say, project, and uh, uh, it it has a very strong resonance. It's my experience of uh, yeah. being in for ten years now around this subject. Mm. It's just uh, starting, you could say. Yeah. So. We are just starting, but let's yeah. hope now we, <laughs> we will make some progress by the end of the yeah. year. Thank you very much, Madeline. I hope yeah. to, to extend this conversation on yes. another page. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very you. Much. See you. See you. Bye. Bye.